Well, good afternoon. My name is Rusty Forger, and I'll lead us through this memorial for Nancy Jean Peacock. So good that, of you to join us today. Uh, first thing out of the way is if you haven't silenced your cell phones, please do that now. Just make sure you've done that. That'd be really appreciated. The other thing is just a housekeeping item is that uh, the washrooms are out the door and to your left if you need to use them. And having said all that, let's stand and sing our first hymn, Great is Thy Faithfulness.
mom was always my hero. <laughs> she was the woman of strong faith. Mom read Bible every day and was good memorizing scripture. Hmm. On road trips, we always sang hymns in the car together, which is where I always got my love for the old hymns from. I catch myself constantly singing them to myself when I'm alone. And I like to sing them with my friend during Bible study a lot. Mom was also a loving friend to me. My favorite memories <laughs> include working together in the kitchen and playing cards a few times a week. Mom was a great card partner. We would sit down and play canasta together and invite our friend Nancy up to play on weekends with us. Thank you. Mom could always, mom was always trying to bury herself at cards. She could beat me. She could beat me at knap the most of the time, but in golf, she didn't have much of a chance. <laughs> <laughs> mom always loved babies and children. She spent a day for most of the growing up years. For the last few years of her life, she worked part time as a nanny. I used to love to go once a week to help out with the children. We would bake banana loaf with the kids and read lots of books together. Thank you, Silas, Caleb, and Elise for all the memories of the last few years. My other memories, my other most special memories tended to happen around Christmas. In November, we would go to the dollar store together and shop for Christmas child shoe boxes together. I used to love picking them with the toys and trying to get them into the boxes with mom. We In December, we liked to decorate the house and put up the tree of Mary's angel ornaments. We used to do Advent books a lot in the evenings, and we always sing Christmas carols at night. Mom loved Christmas and made, always made the season feel special. The night my mom passed, I had a dream. In my dream, she was in a room surrounded by a whole bunch of ladies. <laughs> there were two main ladies. One was very quiet here, one was quite outgoing. The outgoing one told my mom, you have more faith in the master than my sister and I had when our brother died. Turns out it was most likely Martha and Mary, the sisters of Lazarus. This encouraged me because it showed me that my mom's faith was so strong. She needed to have a strong faith because the last eight years of her life, she had so much stacked up against her. I am grateful for my mom's strong faith and her love. Thank you, Mom, for everything. I will miss you. Thanks. Beautiful. Come and stand by me. So my name is Sue, and I'm a friend of the family, a friend of Nancy's, and I think I must be one of her friends from a long, long time ago. Our mothers were good friends, and so we knew each other from small children whenever her family was in Victoria. It wasn't just Nancy I knew, of course, it was the whole Smith family. And then a number of years uh, when they were, when uh, uh, Steve, and Norm and Nancy were starting high school. Uh, they came, they moved to Victoria and they actually went to the same high school I was going to and I walked past their place on my way to school. So we were high school friends. I was a grade above Nancy, but we had a free period together, which was kind of nice. We sat and ate um, ice cream sandwiches from the machine and uh, lots of talking. And Nancy and I also traveled in Europe together. Our first, we were only 18, and we went to Europe and did a bus tour and visited Smith relatives in England and some of my relatives. We shared an, a, another point. We shared an apartment together in Victoria, and uh, that was the that was the first time I ever 
considered having a real Christmas tree because Nancy wanted Christmas to be something more special. And of course, she really expanded on that as the years went by. And many of you will know much more about, like Haley does, about what Christmas is all about. But that year, we had a full-size Christmas tree in our apartment. She had strung popcorn and made it very special. And then we had countless numbers of uh, friends and people coming to visit us over those, over those days. Uh, eventually, of course, Nancy moved to uh, Lethbridge, and then I had to do the visiting um, because she was wanting to be closer to family. And I think of anything, of one of the things that is so special about Nancy is her commitment to family, the Smith family and staying connected. And then, to, of course, then she married Harold, and Haley and Spencer came into her life, and the Peacock family, how she just loved, loved all that wider expanded family and that just came through in any time that we ever visited talking about um, all the stories so I felt like I knew who everybody was even though I had never met any of the other peacocks before this last um, few weeks so when I think about Nancy and we and many of the memories um, are very common for her friends to say we always think of food and baking and then Nancy's network of friends that were through scrapbooking and through through the friends of or the parents of a lot of the kids that Haley and Spencer grew up with and that whole network through her church friends through her work through her family just uh, her her friendship world, her scrapbooking friends, my goodness. I wish she had known about the scrapbooking when she and I went to Europe because the documentation of that trip is very, very meager. I do have a real photo of the two of us standing at Stonehenge where, <laughs> but in those days you were actually able to stand right in the midst of the stones, but our pictures were pretty pathetic. <laughs> She was, of course, we also remember her for her, her great hospitality, her big heart. And I always say this is Nancy's, um, Nancy, one of her values in life was to love and value people. And she demonstrated that in ever so many ways. In just being the master of making lists and menus and being prepared for, for hosting numerous people into into their home but she also welcomed people into her life in such a precious way her friends like just everywhere I look and I look around this room and I see people that I know are lifelong friends that she has invested in and always you felt special being being with her she could help make things happen and with her very practical, she can make it, it she had such a can-do attitude. And then she would just go over the top. Like I would think, well, just put, just put hot dog buns and a few hot dogs there and let people figure it out. Oh, no, it always had to be something more special. And she would say, no, it's really easy. It's really easy. And then she would put everybody to work. <laughs> right? <laughs> She had Haley helping her as a sous chef at home all the time, going to get this, can you get this out of the cupboard? Can you get that out of the cupboard? But in that same way, she would put everybody to work, which was such a special thing. And of course, so in that practicing of hospitality, which is such um, uh, a command all through scripture to practice hospitality, and I don't think she practiced it, I think she mastered it, but she was one who was welcoming to people, not just into her home, but into her life, and where we all felt so much a part of it. I was overseas for many, many years. We hardly saw each other for a long time, um, and yet every time we met up, it was always like we had just had coffee together the day before, which was precious. And a few years ago, when I was visiting, this is before Nancy's most recent um, health challenges, Mercy had asked me when we, the three of us were having lunch, oh, and Haley was there, four of us were having lunch together, and Mercy said, has Nancy changed since all those years ago when we were teenagers? And, and honestly, I was stuck for a minute 
And then I thought, well, no, in some ways, no, she hasn't changed at all. She's the same person. She still loves and values people. And she is still the same friend she was then. Um, but yeah, there was that solid core in her of trust in God, loving him, wanting to follow Jesus. And that was a pretty remarkable thing. On the other hand, she certainly changed from the teenager she was how she handled things and she grew. She gained so much life experience, great joys. You look at her children, you look at Harold. She had great sorrows that she bore with amazing grace and challenges with her own health over the years. Like Haley said, it's, it, was not an e it has not been an easy time for her. And yet in all of that, she learned so many things and she was open to learn and to change. And the thing that probably sticks with me the most is gratitude, that she, that was such a journey that God had her on in those years after losing Harold. And of course he's not lost. We know exactly where he is. We know where she is. She's not lost, just not with us right now. But the, her gratitude for all the years that they had, thankfulness, and I have thought on that a lot in the last few days, of the gratefulness, the gratitude I have for a friendship that lasted many, many years, for all the many ways that um, she has blessed me personally. And I see all the friends that also have been blessed by her and who, um, who were a blessing to her, and she recognized that. So many of you I see are precious in her sight. So my, my, my heart is to continue with that theme of gratitude, being thankful for what we had, and looking forward to what God has in the future for all these people that he loves. And um, uh, just a special gratitude for me with for the Smith family who were very significant the whole family not just Nancy in my own walk with Jesus and learning learning more about him they were had a huge part that includes Byron her uncle who isn't really like an uncle just a family just family anyways thank you very much okay Good afternoon. It's nice to see so many, <clears throat> excuse me, familiar faces. But we do not grieve with, as those without hope. Grief is a complex human emotion. We don't feel grief the same way. Chances are that there's not one person in this room that's grieving exactly the same way. But for those of us who share a faith in God, not one of us grieves without hope. Hope for the promise of a life beyond this earthly one, a hope of someday being reunited with our loved ones who also shared faith in Jesus Christ. We share that hope with Nancy, with Harold, with those that we have loved that have gone on before us and who knew our friend Jesus. Does this mean that we're not sorrowful or maybe even reeling from the seeming injustice? God's all right with that. But we recognize that this, that he is in control and that this separation is temporary. And that's how Nancy viewed it too. Um, I'm gonna be doing a song and I chose this song by Lauren Daigle because Nancy's twin brother, Norm, likes this particular artist. And because I wanted to share a song in American Sign Language that didn't overwhelm us with sadness but that also could help us process our grief. I have to warn you though, you have to really listen to get the intent of the song. Um, to truly know someone, we have to know what is important to them, what moves them, what is a non-negotiable with them. And for Nancy, it was her faith in God, as you've already heard, and her love for her savior, Jesus Christ. Many of you don't know who I am, that's all right. 
but I want to present this song to you because Nancy loved ASL music. Uh, it tells a visual story of the words that you're listening to. And I hope that today you see something that moves you, that resonates with your feelings and encourages you to look up as we all share our grief and process this loss together. And I trust that you will all feel the hope and the promise. To know why I cry every time I see a sunset To know why I smile at all the things I can't forget To know why my heart may take a while to mend To know me, you would have to know my friend I can't help but dream when I hear a train coming To know me, you would have to know my friend. To know me, you would have to know my I'm Harold's younger sister, Miriam, and uh, we were fortunate enough to um, have left Ottawa a couple years ago and had a couple years here in um, Alberta again to be able to spend time with Nancy, and we're really, really grateful that we have. I'd like to read a favorite psalm of Nancy's, um, it, and it means a lot to us right now. Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me by still waters. He restores my soul. 
He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Good afternoon. I was asked to share. I can never get through this stuff, so I opted for a poem. I was also concerned if I got going, I wouldn't get out, get you guys out of here before eight o'clock tonight, so. I'm the baby sister, and at 59, I was always the baby sister, because my big sister always took care of me. Feel no guilt in laughter. She knows how much you care. Feel no sorrow in a smile that she's not here to share. You cannot grieve forever. She wouldn't want you to. She'd hope that you would carry on the way you always do. So talk about the good times and the way you showed you cared. The days you spent together and all the happiness that you shared. Let memories surround you. A word someone may say will suddenly recapture a time, an hour, a day, that brings her back as clearly as though she was here and fills you with the feelings that she is always near. For if you keep these moments, you will never be apart and she will live forever locked safe within your heart. So when we were kids, mom always had this tradition Thanks. I'll step back to sing. When we were kids, uh, mom had this tradition where still blurry eyed from sleep, still just stumbled down the stairs, not sure what you're gonna eat for breakfast. Nope, get on the couch, it's time to sing some hymns. (laughs) And honestly, I'm so glad she did it because, well, it taught us the hymns for one thing, but just it made some real nice memories and Probably one of the most vivid was when she taught us songs from Fanny Crosby, one of her absolute favorite hymn writers. And this is the one I remember best. (coughs) Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, Purchase of God, born of his spirit, washed in his blood. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect communion, perfect delight, visions of rapture now burst in my sight. Angels descending, they bring from above echoes of mercy, whispers of love. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. 
This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, all is at rest. I and my Savior am happy and blessed, watching and waiting, looking above. Sorry. Filled with his goodness, lost in his love. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. I'm blown away by that. I thought it took a lot of nerve to come up here and do a tribute, but if they'd ask me to sing an a cappella solo, I wouldn't be up here. So what I decided to do, I know it's important to get through this, um, I actually wrote a, na a note for Nancy, and I would just like to read that to you so that I can get through it. Nancy, since you left us, my mind has been going back through the years to times when our lives intersected, and my memories of some of those times. I'm writing this to share some of them with you and some of the things I learned from how you lived your life. I think one of my earliest memories of you is from when we all returned from living in England for three years. You would have been three or four years old. When we got to the Blair's house where we were to live downstairs, your first words to Mrs. To Mrs. Blair were, have you got any babies? <laughs> it was a love for little ones that lasted through your life as you babysat for years and as you took them into your home and loved on them. Your work ethic was clear throughout your life, the very many jobs you took on. From a waitress at Don's Drive-In in the Queen Charlotte Islands, where I remember you waitressing upon me and seeing more fries on my plate than anyone else's. Um, and a receptionist and an executive assistant and even a militant postal worker for a time. I remember our heated discussions about union positives and negatives. And also in the home daycare that you ran, which was really hard work. The best example, actually, was our year on Crooked Island. I'm having trouble with the technology here. Give me a second. Um, on Crooked Island in the Bahamas in 1970, as well as you're working on your grade 10, by correspondence, you cooked and baked and cleaned at the inn with mom in the heat and the sand flies, while Norm and I snorkeled and fished. <laughs> I appreciate how hard you worked, and I'm ashamed of the fact that I didn't say so at the time. Remember the brief time we lived in the tiny upstairs apartment in that hundred-year-old house in Lethbridge? And thinking back, it was much the same as in the Bahamas, just as hot as there was no air conditioning. And you cooked and baked and cleaned while I ate. <laughs> Remember Ebony Bunny, who moved in with us? You wanted a cage for him. So I built him one out of countertop scrap from work. I debated whether to put the arborite side up on the bottom of the cage and then decided to. I was so glad in the end when I discovered that the cute, fuzzy black bunny was in the end a urine sponge who would wring himself out at about supper time every night. <laughs> that was it. Either he left or I would leave. I left. <laughs> I wondered how keeping that rabbit in your 
in your home ever jibe with how fanatical you became about housekeeping? Maybe he was the reason. I remember recently being concerned about a speck of dust that inadvertently landed on the kitchen floor in your house. He was oblivious to the fact that his life had just been shortened to mere minutes or at the outside an hour. So then you met Harold. You built a life with him and moved away to Edmonton and had babies of your own to love and to raise. But we were always welcome to come and visit, mostly for weekends. When someone mentions the gift of hospitality, you come to mind. Always an effort to have what our favorite meals or desserts were, everything laid out on the calendar on the fridge. Every day in the month filled with reminders of who, when, and what you, you were going to eat and do. Your organizational abilities were second to none. I learned secrets that helped an unstructured guy survive in a job that needed structure. I had calendars and organized post-it notes throughout my office. It was so apparent that you had love in your life. You and Harold loved and were devoted to each other and to your kids. And your mutual love for God was evident too. Another thing that I learned from our visits was how essential the, to life table games are. All of you are passionate about them. So was I. I hate them with great passion. <laughs> Primarily because I suck at them. That coupled with the fact that Cindy usually wins them, which is just salt in the wound. But I did play them in your home many times. You are a great negotiator. Even before coming, I knew that if I played without complaining, you would make us my favorite dessert, which was mom's caramel dumplings, right after I played games. <laughs> Your faith and strength as a woman shone through when you lovingly and practically cared for first mom and then dad in their final days. Your love for them was both was so profound and evident in your service to them. But Nan, the most profound effect you've had on me comes out of the last 10 or so years of seeing the adversity on many fronts that came your way and watching how you handled it. Losing the love of your life way too early, then getting up and continuing on to provide for Haley and Spencer's needs as they had lost their dad as well. Then rounds of chemo and the difficult fight against cancer, three times. No complaining about your lot in life or the difficulties, but a positive, we'll get through this attitude. You proposed a picture of you and I together with big smiles on, sporting our identical hairdos. <laughs> we have it displayed proudly in our home. Then this final fight against the disease that ravaged your mind and stole, stole your strength before it took your life. I learned a couple of things from you even in this. The main thing is that investment in people's lives and into friendships in particular is a huge valuable thing. Your stay at Devonshire was constantly punctuated with visits from many that consider you their friend. It stood in stark contrast to many there that appeared to have few, if any, visitors. One patient asked Nancy, are you the mayor? <laughs> As he'd seen so many visitors come in. And also your continued faith in God in spite of what life brought your way in the end is a lesson for all of us. We miss you, Nan. We're sorry that you left us. But we are happy for you that the struggle down here is over for you. You and Harold are both where you deserve to be and want to be, home with Jesus. Yeah, I'll get that real close. Good afternoon. 
Before I begin, and I'm going to read, uh, the advantage of um, using technology over paper is that you can't tell with the phone how long he's going to take, whereas <laughs> for me, you can sort of see it. Um, I'd like to begin by thanking everyone who worked so hard to make today possible. Thank you so much. I um, also want to thank so many of you in this room who have worked so diligently to invest in the lives of Nancy and Spencer and Haley over this last year. Thank you so much for that. And I'd especially like to thank um, Gwen and Mercy and their husbands, their patient husbands, for the many years that you've been Nancy's dearest friends. I got a long way to go here. <laughs> for your dedication to stand with Nancy and her family in so many ways and for so long. Thank you for the countless hours you've spent helping Nancy's family face each and every challenge, particularly over the last 18 months. Your love and hard work has always been appreciated by all of us who don't live in Edmonton, so thank you. Isn't it wonderful to know that Nancy is free from confusion and anxiety and free from pain. Nancy's body has been renewed and she's finally home with the Lord. So I'm Norm Smith, Nancy's brother. You've already heard from my sister and, and brother. Lori lives in Oakville, Ontario and Steve and Cindy live in Lethbridge. My wonderful wife, Michelle, signed the Lauren Daigle song earlier. Michelle and I are missionaries with the Canadian Free Church Mission. I've spent much of the last 35 years serving in Germany and Budapest, Hungary. We currently live in White Rock and Michelle works with the deaf and I'm working, uh, continuing to do my work with Reach Global Europe. Nancy and I were lots of different things to each other and for each other. We were obviously brother and sister, and we were also very good friends, but as most of you know, we were twins. There is typically a very strong bond between twins, and Nancy and I were no exception. Nancy and I spent our first 20 years living in the same household. Uh, we did much of our schooling together. We attended church and Sunday school together. We did uh, vacations together and moved around the country together. We did all the things that siblings normally do together during their childhood and teen years. We even attended Bible college together. Michelle and I then spent the next 10 years in the same city as Nancy, namely Lethbridge. We went to the same church. We enjoyed many of the same experiences with Nancy um, during those years, uh, hanging out, camping out in our tent trailer, all sorts of fun times together, challenging times together and sharing many family experiences as us four Smith siblings um, figured out what it was like to live close by each other as adults. It was so wonderful having Nancy living only two blocks away as our firstborn son, as our first son was born in, in 79. Nancy was such a great doting aunt for both our boys. I'm gonna share a few stories and myths and quips about our years growing up as twins. Back to the pre-beginning, before we were born, there are lots of old wives' tales about how one can best improve their chances of twins being conceived. <clears throat> For example, in some parts of Africa, they suggest you eat yams, lots of yams. In North America, they suggest you drink bourbon. <laughs> as with many tales of old, there's a wee bit of science in both these ideas, um, but I'll leave it up to you to figure out which idea you'd go with. Today we know science says that it's the mother's genetic makeup that has the final say. I can't tell you if our mom, Alice, employed either of these methods, but on Friday, October 28, 1955, Nancy and I were born in Calgary. Nancy Jean Smith was a pre-dawn baby born at 6.30 a.m., and then I arrived 20 minutes later. There's a cute quote that goes, a good neighbor will babysit, 
a great neighbor will babysit twins. <laughs> well, it didn't take my mom long to realize that she needed a great neighbor. Shortly after we were born, my dad's job transferred him to England. Dad was in the Royal Canadian Air Force, and they needed him at his new posting right away. That meant mom had to travel a month later from Calgary to Montreal by herself with two four-month-old twins and baby Steve, who had just turned two. So first they traveled three days on the train, 2,300 miles to Montreal, and then from Montreal to Southampton, England, six days on a ship, again by herself. When the train finally got them to Montreal, mom realized she needed more diapers for the three kids than she had brought. So she solicited help from a fellow traveler who agreed to look after Nancy and her adorable two brothers <laughs> while mom scurried off to buy more diapers, only in 1956. Uh, with diapers in hand for all three of us, Mom got back to the boat in time to sail, much to the delight of the harried stand-in babysitter. <laughs> Our mom told us later that she was very glad for the twin factor because many people offered to help her at various times during that journey. You will notice some repeats here. That's okay, Steve. We didn't commiserate, so. Um, Nan and I were almost four when our family returned home to Canada, complete with our perfect English accents. And Nancy's favorite question as she met people was, as Steve said, have you got any babies? <laughs> yeah, it's true. Another myth I came across was that one twin would be good, leaving the other one with the lion's share of bad. Well, Nancy was definitely the good twin. <laughs> well, I'm not quite the evil twin you see in the movies, Somehow, I was the one who was always getting into trouble. As little gaffers, Nancy and I were very close and spent a lot of time together, inseparable, really. During our early years at school, in kindergarten, we were in the same class, and poor Nancy would get quite upset and cry whenever I would get in myself into trouble, which seemed to be rather often. So finally, after a month of this, the school made the decision to put us in different classrooms. <laughs> We were in separate classrooms through fourth grade, but were reunited for fifth, sixth, and seventh grade because we had attended a much smaller school those three years. By then, Nancy didn't mind as much when I was disciplined in class. <laughs> we also had the same home room in 12th grade, but by then I had evolved into a nearly perfect student, so Nancy didn't have to worry about me misbehaving anymore. My nose is getting bigger. Um, <laughs> For as long as I can remember, Nancy loved children and babysitting. During our years growing up on bases here and there, Nancy was always a much sought after babysitter. I remember one of the first babysitting jobs Nancy had was for Mr. and Mrs. Can, who lived next door to our house. It was 1965 and Nancy was just about to turn 10 years old. Her babysitting career blossomed from there and so did her love for children. Nancy babysat for countless families during our years growing up. 30 years later, Michelle and I worked with um, Canadian missionary colleagues in Germany who had amazingly lived down the street from us um, in 1968 on the base in Winnipeg. And I remember, uh, and they remembered fondly that Nancy had babysat their children many times. More recently here in Edmonton, Nancy worked for many years as a nanny for three different families caring for their young children while their parents were at work. Nancy loved each one of those little ones as though they were own. I remember one of those mothers dropping by the Devonshire with her children to see Nancy during one of my recent visits. As most of you know, Nancy also loved good food and preparing food. No small wonder, since our mom, Alice, was a great cook and loved to bake. During Nan's growing up years is when she learned to love cooking and baking. Nancy developed her passion for preparing meals and preparing desserts as mom had done before her. I especially remember how Nancy loved to make me one of my favorite desserts, 
caramel dumplings. <laughs> Every time Michelle and I would come to Edmonton to visit, and I could count on it, and I always had dibs on any seconds. So some highlights of Nan's years growing up in our family. Because my dad was in the Canadian Air Force, we lived in many houses on many different bases in Canada as well as in England. Nancy was born in Calgary and then we lived near Nottingham in England for three and a half years and then back to Calgary and then on to Winnipeg. Next was a radar base Holberg on northern Vancouver Island. Um, then dad was transferred back to Winnipeg where he retired from the military in 1970. After retiring, while well, Steve, Nancy and I were um, in our mid-teens, our family lived in the Bahamas for a year. Nancy and I did grade 10 by correspondence that year, and I remember Nancy being so kind and helpful to me as I struggled with one of my courses. Nancy was a good listener and almost always sympathetic, even when I was wrong or when I was upset with someone else's poor behavior. She often stood up for me when us kids were called on the carpet for something. I always knew I had an ally when there was trouble afoot. Nan and I understood each other, and without sounding twin corny, our trust and appreciation for each other became even more important as we got older. When our family moved back to Canada in 71, we lived in Victoria for a year, where Nan and I attended 11th grade at Vic High and then Gordon Head High School. In January of the next year, our dad took a job at the Armed Forces Base in Masset on the Queen Charlotte Islands, and our family was on the move again. Dad built us a house there, which we lived in for three or four years, and Nancy and I graduated from George M. Dawson Secondary in 1973. And during that year, Nancy worked, as Steve said, part-time at Don's Drive-In. It was a local Main Street greasy spoon for sure, but it was always busy, and the owner loved Nancy's work ethic. After graduating, Nancy got a job on the base working as a secretary in the base administration office. In 1975, Nancy attended Bible school in Culver City, California. Steve had gone to the school a year before and had enjoyed his experience there. Nancy and I decided we each wanted to attend CCBS and we felt it made sense for us both to do the one-year program at the same time. Uh, my wife, Michelle, and I had met in Victoria that summer. Since Michelle was also going to CCBS that fall, the three of us drove down to California together. Nancy and I were in different dorms that year, but we saw each other every day and spent time together whenever we could. Nancy was a more focused and dedicated student than I was at that time, but we both came out of that year feeling we had learned so much from uh, so many things that prepared us for serving the Lord as adults. And after Bible school, Nancy lived with mom and dad and Lori in the Bahamas for a year, and then lived in Victoria working at Canada Post before settling in Lethbridge in 1978. Nancy worked at CMHC for a few years, and during that time was often at our house to spend time with her two little nephews who came along in 79 and 81. Nancy met Harold Peacock, thanks to the wonderful matchmaking of our dear friend Chris Stewart. And the rest is history. Nancy married Harold in October of 85. Less than two years later, little Haley was born. And five years after that, Spencer was born. As Nan grew up and we reached our teens, many people would ask us if we experienced the legendary ESP-like communication many twins did. It seemed we never quite mastered that one, but Nan and I have always had a great appreciation for staying connected. For many years, Nancy, uh, Michelle and I rather, lived overseas. That was back in the day when all we could do was write letters uh, because phoning from Germany or Hungary was way too expensive. Um, when email came on the scene in the early 90s, we reverted to email to stay in touch. Then we used Skype as our mainstay when it became popular in 2003. During those years, we were returning to Canada as often as we could. We traveled up to Edmonton whenever we were able to. We loved to reconnect with Harold and Nancy and the kids, but for me, I especially look forward to having face-to-face -face time with Nancy. Nancy and Harold came to visit us in Europe during 
our years overseas. That was such a special time for us and for them. They came to visit in 2010 and we had a wonderful time showing them around Budapest and even took a trip back to Germany to show them Black Forest Academy and to Switzerland where we stayed at a chalet overlooking the Alps, a place where Michelle and I and our boys had spent many a night during our years at BFA. Um, Nancy also loved photography and scrapbooking and creating books of all their adventures. One story I have to share is about our time together with Nancy and Harold at the chalet in Switzerland. One morning, Harold and Nancy were up early and had gone for a walk. Both had their cameras and they were ready to get some great shots of the beautiful Swiss mountain village. Sometime after they left, I got up and decided to go down to the lower, lower level below the chalet to chop some wood for the fireplace. I was wearing cozy pants, a shirt, a vest, and a toque. I was chopping wood and kindling and looked up to see Nancy busy snapping photos of me from the parking pad on the street above the chalet. She was very focused on what I was doing, moving around to get the best shot she possibly could. When I was finished, I went inside where Nancy greeted me and couldn't wait to show me the awesome photo she had taken of the little old Swiss granny who was chopping wood <laughs> down below our chalet. Nan hadn't been wearing her glasses and had no idea that I was the little old granny. We laughed about that for years. I can still see her scrambling around to get the best possible shot of me. Pretty hilarious. Yes, it's true, Nancy was born first, and then 20 minutes later, I came along. Throughout our childhood, Nancy would remind me of that fact many, 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 many times. But I was okay with that. Nancy was my dearest friend and I looked up to her all my life. About four years ago, Nancy and I decided we were gonna connect by phone or computer more often. We initially enjoyed using FaceTime and also chatted on the phone. Nancy and I knew we could count on each other as we shared our hearts and did our best to bear each other's burdens. Nancy was most always so determined to press on despite the many adversities she faced over the last eight or nine years. And I'm very grateful for that level of communication that Nan and I have enjoyed throughout our 67 years, but especially these past four years. We kept a weekly connection going for a long time and more recently we spoke on the phone every few days until Nancy could no longer use the phone. It was a cherished privilege for me to be able to fly to Edmonton to spend time with Nan many times during this past year and each time I was there we were always able to do three special things together. We shared many old family memories, we prayed and we talked about heaven. It doesn't get much better than that. So to wrap this up, this is the last time we will all come together to think specifically of Nancy and remember what a wonderful woman she was and how each of us was fortunate to be part of her life. I was the most fortunate though. I was her twin. And I also wish I had a hundred bucks for every time someone asked Nancy or me over all of our years, are you identical twins? <laughs> you wouldn't believe how many times I got that. Thanks, Nanny, for being an amazing sister, a wonderful friend, and an incredible mom. We miss you, but we know you are home now. And thank you for listening to all our stories. Thank you. Let's stand and sing How Great Thou Art. See you.
thy power throughout the universe displayed. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my sweetly in the trees when I look down from lofty mountain grandeur and hear the brook and feel the gentle breeze then sings my soul my Savior God to thee how great thou art how great thou sparing sent him to die I scarce can take it in that on the cross my burden gladly bearing he bled and died to take away my sin then sings my soul my savior God to me how great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. When Christ shall come with shout. sings my soul, my Savior God to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Please be seated. Thank you. Thank you all for your contributions and as we remember our friend and sister. There's a lot to be said about our friend and sister Nancy. There's, we've heard themes emerge about this amazing person. As you heard earlier, one of, uh, we sang one of Nancy's favorite hymns that goes, How great, great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. There's no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not thy compassions. They fail not. As thou hast been, thou forever will be. Great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. 
Morning by morning new mercies I see. All I have needed thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Well, for those who've traveled the circuitous route with Nancy this last year since she suffered a brain abscess on top of her cancers, one might be tempted to ask, is God faithful? Did he let Nancy down? Did he forsake his daughter when she needed him most? And I want to answer that emphatically. God is faithful. God did not forsake Nancy. Because in this last year of Nancy's life, when she could no longer care for herself and others, when she could no longer string together those amazing, impressive, articulate thoughts, when she could no longer express her gratitude, God surrounded his daughter with his people. Many of you, as family and friends who cared for her at the expense of your own health and sense of gratitude, and you took care of Nancy as if you were taking care of Jesus himself. For as Jesus said, what you did for the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did it for me. You took care of Nancy in times, in a time when so many of Nancy's age and ailment simply die alone. Not so with Nancy, as you've heard, there was a noticeable tribe of friends and family. And if Nancy were here to speak for herself, I'm convinced she would say, thank you. You see, Nancy had a practice habit, or I should be more honest and say she had an obsession <laughs> with gratitude. It, started, it probably started before 2011, but in 2011 she read Anne Voskamp's book, 1,000 Gifts, a book about gratitude. In fact, a copy is on the, the table outside. Nancy was a sort of person who didn't just read for information, she read and applied, and then what she did is got people around her to read and practice the fine art and discipline of giving thanks. There is a verse found um, in the Apostle Paul's letter to the Thessalonian church that is always presented a challenge. It goes, be joyful always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Well, for any of you who've, who live the spiritual life or who have honestly and admittedly suffered, we know we cannot give thanks for all things, but in the mystery of being in Christ, we can give thanks in all circumstances. Her first entry in her gratitude journal, and I have it here, you can imagine this is volume one, just like Nancy, right? <laughs> Her first entry in her gratitude journal, uh, dated September 2011, was thankful for hard circumstances that forced me to run to you. She didn't date most of her entries. She numbered them. So her last entry of her journal was 4,730, <laughs> roughly three blessings a day over the span of that journal. But her last note of thanks was this. Thankful for a difficult yet beautiful day. Now you can appreciate that Nancy would not miss a day. Not even on August 4th, 2015, one of the few entries she dated, the very day that her husband Harold died, and she writes this. Thankful for my beloved husband Harold who died today. Can I praise you in the storm? Well, a few years later, Nancy would write this, and she shared this with uh, her church family. The night that Harold went to heaven, I settled into bed, realizing I had a choice I knew I had to make. Either I continue my practice of kneeling beside my bed and looking back over the day and seeing and recording the God gifts within that day, or I can give in to the misery of the hardest blow I've ever received and leave that practice behind. My adult brain was saying, how can you give thanks on this day when you kissed the cool lips of your beloved husband for the very last time, the day when you knew you would never again see his face? A battle ensued, this is Nancy's writing still, a battle ensued and a tiny voice of the spirit that I've come to recognize whispered, this will be the vehicle of my presence as you go through what lies ahead. 
Bring me your weakness, your brokenness, and I will catch every tear. I will listen to every anguished question. I will heal your fractured heart and give you peace. The only part you have to do is remember that thanksgiving always comes before the miracle. So today, what Nancy wrote years ago sounds so prophetic, doesn't it? She knew the secret of a life of gratitude. She knew to give thanks because the God Nancy worshiped then and whom she worships now in joyful abandon is the source and destination of all gratitude despite the circumstances. I imagine if she were here, she'd tell you that. She'd tell you about the joy of knowing God in Christ and how she has woven, how he has woven in the strands of her beautiful and hard life into an amazing tapestry that reveals the beauty of the one who made her for himself. I have no illusion that many of you are grieving and suffering now and that for me to hint that you can be thankful might sound outrageously pious and insensitive. But the wise who've gone before us recognize the gift that is gratitude. Annie Dillard <coughs> writes, I think that the dying pray in, at the end, not please, but thank you as a guest as a guest thanks the host the door. She knew something of the secret of a life of gratitude at the moment of mourning, that our exits shall be exposed for their wonder and shall elicit praise. In June uh, 2021, a popular TV talent show featured a singer who went by the uh, stage name of Nightbird. She was there to sing a song she wrote called It's Okay which she described as the story about the last year of my life. She knew she was dying with terminal cancer, but before she sang, she said this to the judges and to the audience. It's important that everyone knows that I'm so much more than the bad things that happened to me. You can't wait until life isn't hard anymore before you decide to be happy. Or as I would say, or maybe as Nancy would say, you can't wait until life isn't hard anymore before you decide to be thankful. In one of her blogs posted, uh, uh, God is on the bathroom floor. If you can't see him look lower, Nightbird writes, I see mercy in the dusty sunlight that outlines the trees in my mother's, and I see mercy in my mother's crooked hands and the blanket my friend left for me in the harmony of the wind chimes. It's not the mercy that I ask for, it's mercy nonetheless. And I've learned a new prayer, thank you. It's a prayer I don't mean yet, but I will repeat it until I do. Call me cursed, call me lost, call me scorned, but that's not all. Call me chosen, blessed, sought after. Call me the one whom, who God whispers his secrets to. I am the one whose belly is filled with the loaves of mercy that were hidden, hidden for me. God is on the bathroom floor. If you cannot see him, look lower. You see, when we understand how radically present God is in our world, we need only look around to find God having been there all along. We find God who is present. For as Jesus promises, ask and it'll be given you, seek and you will find, knock and the door will be open unto you for everyone who asks, receives. Everyone who seeks, finds. And everyone who knocks, the door will be open. Now, as Nancy realized years ago, either you can learn the practice of looking back over your day and see and record the God gifts within that day, or you can give in to the misery of the hardest blows you'll ever receive and descend into despair. Well, since we're all on a spiritual journey, perhaps this is the moment you seek the God whom Nancy worships now and enter into his joyful gratitude for you. For we believe that God is continually looking for you to return. Amen. I'm going to ask Lord Pollock to come in and close our time in prayer.
Before I do that, I just want to say thanks to Norm and Steve for <clears throat> bringing up Nancy's caramel dumplings. <laughs> Let us pray. Thank you, Father, for this <clears throat> opportunity that we've had here today to, to celebrate, to mourn, and to honor Nancy in this way. We thank you. We thank you for having known this absolutely wonderful and beautiful person. We will miss her. We pray for everyone here and those that couldn't make it, family and friends, as we continue to grieve for her loss. But we look forward to the day where the memories of her will bring more smiles than sadness. We want to specifically lift up Spencer and Haley. We pray that the Holy Spirit would comfort them speak to them, encourage them, and guide them into their future endeavors. We thank you that Harold and Nancy just raised them to be absolutely wonderful kids. And we pray for them that during these days and the days to come that they would lean into you more and more. And finally, we pray all of these things in the name of Jesus, whom Nancy loved and knew as both friend and Lord. Amen. For those who missed it, maybe if you came in a little later, we'll still, I believe, we'll be going through sort of the pictures of uh, sort of Nancy and family and friends, uh, so you can stick around to watch that a bit. Um, if you have to go right away, I still encourage you to go by the memory table that's in the lobby. But if you're going to stick around, please uh, make your way into the gym. We have uh, food and refreshments for you, and it's an opportunity to reconnect with people who cared and loved for Nancy. <laughs> 